Hi, it's Dave from Drive Adventure and welcome back to the channel. Today we're back to Costco Drives, episode five. I hope uh, viewers enjoyed our chat last week with Mal's new house as we went through the two engine throwings and how he was able to secure that fabulous 997 GT3 RS 4 litre. I hope you enjoyed that. Something a little bit different, and that's what I want my channel to be. I want it to be original and to be different, and uh, hopefully, you got something out of that. And I'm going to just talk a little bit more about the car market and around Porsche GT cars today, in today's video. As we know, we're not far too long to go now, it's not far too long to go before Porsche will be releasing the new 992 GT3. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, just getting access and being able to get allocations for GT3 cars. Look at this thing here. <laughs> Completely lost his way. Probably didn't see that, but never mind. You must put winter tyres on your cars. I keep saying it to people, but you know, for what they cost, if you use your car in the winter and you do not put winter tyres on your car, you're gonna, you're gonna have a banana skin moment you might not be able to uh, recover from. But anyway, also later in the video, I'm gonna talk about, I've been having quite a few people contact me and say, Dave, are you doing any car meets? Are you doing any sort of uh, get togethers? Are you doing any trips? Or can I come on one of your trips? And this, that and the other. For those of you who haven't seen the video of the Highlands trip we did earlier this year, check it out because that's uh, was an amazing trip. Anyway, I've had a few people contacting me about that. And so, yes, I think in 2021, Drive Ventures is going to diversify. <laughs> we're we're going to be we're going to be setting up a club and it's going to be around uh, centered around Porsche ownership mainly and we'll be having beats, we'll be having social stuff, we'll be having drives, we'll be having tours. But I've just got to kind of formulate the thoughts around it a bit more clearly, how it's going to how it's going to go and you know how we're going to release it. And I think we'll probably just use Facebook as a platform and WhatsApp as well and things like that. I've got a website I could do something with that, but that's more money, so we'll just have to see. Anyway, but I think that'll be coming in 2021, so, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to that because I'm in a few car clubs and, you know, they offer different things, so, you know, I just want to do something that's my own thing and it's not to be a competitor, it's just to offer something a bit different, something that appeals to all of my tastes, so anyway, that's it. Uh, going to come in 2021 it's not a good time to, to launch something about get to getting together we're in the middle of the epidemic called coronavirus which has affected everyone so negatively in 2020 so there we go so let's talk a bit now about this this is uh, my Rolex Sea Dweller double one double six double O and I've said in some of my previous videos where I get into a bit of a watch chat watch talk reviewing it's more often than not a watch that I tend to go to when I am you know, wanting a watch that does everything. Um, this Sea Dweller came into my possession, I think it was 2014, and yes, finally we're going to talk about a watch I purchased from Whittle's uh, Jewelers. So it's going to turn its heat down slightly. Now, Rolex, as we know, you might have seen my little deep dive into the Rolex C$4000, the one double six double O watch. Um, Rolex discontinued that and they moved into the deep sea around 2008, uh, nine. And, you know, it wasn't, it was a bit of a hit early on, but then it really lagged with sales and it brought the deep blue along. And that, that helped the sales to gather pace, but now anything in sports steel for Rolex is just like difficult to get as we know. But anyway, so Rolex has something that some of the missing bit in the portfolio. So what they did was they launched this watch, which was the uh, Sea Dweller 4000 again, and a depth rating of 4,000 feet, 1,220 meters. So a step on from the, the Sea Dweller, this watch wears a bit chunkier on the wrist, even though it's got the same millimetre uh, uh, diameter on the dial, the dial actually I think looks a little bit smaller even though it's not because it's got the flat glass. So the bubble would interest me if my eyesight got so bad I just couldn't see the date without a magnification bubble but I can 
get away with it still. So anyway, I prefer a flat glass, if I'm honest. And so when this watch was launched, I called, I called my dealer, Whittles and Preston, and I said, yeah, I really would like one. And uh, I think it was the second watch they got. I remember seeing the first one they got, they went to some to another customer. And I said, this will be a big seller. Now, little did I know at the time that Rolex, perhaps at that time, hadn't planned on only making this watch for a period of just over two and a half years. It was, it was gone before we knew it really. The watch was out, it was really, relatively popular and then it was just completely discontinued. And they brought out the anniversary edition of the bubble on the glass with the red sea dweller writing. So it's got a wider bracelet, it's got the newer movement and it's got uh, the bubble on the glass. So it's a watch I've thought about. But anyway, I know friends who have them and they are very, very, very nice. But anyway, so this watch now when it went into when it was discontinued, it was a watch that sort of caught people by surprise. Because one thing about Rolex is, if they only make a watch for a very short space of time, and obviously there's, there's, there's far fewer of them in circulation, there's far fewer of them been purchased. Two and a half years versus a standard Submariner timeline. Look at the, the latest, uh, the, the one that just been discontinued, the Ceramics Submariner. That was made for 10 years, so you can see there's going to be far more of those watches in circulation. Again, they were very, very popular versus, say, something like this. So values, this this watch cost me, I think it was about six and a half thousand pounds, something like that. And, and they're now selling for over £12,000. So it's doubled in value since I purchased it in 2014. So, you know, not bad, a bad return in the uh, six, just six, six years or so that I've owned it. Um, so we'll get into a little bit more about this watch uh, when I get stationary further down the road. We're going to get some fuel, I get the supplies. And in part two, I'm going to talk a bit more about the Panamera. ST e hybrid. Well, maybe maybe I'll talk about that now. Actually, yeah, I'll talk about that. Now. So, at a hundred and sort of four hundred and five thousand pounds options, up to sort of one hundred and thirty three thousand pounds. It's a car which is aimed obviously at people that are you know pretty well off because it's it's a, it's a big family cruiser with capaci more capacity at the back in the Sport Turismo uh, line, and you know. It's a car which handles well, drives extremely well, and for that kind of money you would expect it to do that. And I think really it stands alone as a sort of a, the premium segment sports car for practicality if you don't want to go into like SUVs, which personally I'm not, I'm not really, SUVs aren't my thing, I'll be quite honest with you, it's just, uh, you know, they handle well, it's probably the best one to get, a KN or a Macan if you're after an SUV type car. But, you know, we'll be featuring one of those on the channel before too long. So I think for a sort of a road car, not an SUV type type setup, I think that the um, yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice, um, it's a lovely car, crystal, crystal smooth, clear crystal smooth to drive, quiet, comfortable, and you can pump a lot of miles on that, you know, in that in that seat, and you know you're just not even going to feel it when you get to the end. It's really really good. So I certainly recommend if you're thinking about one, so go and have a drive of one because you compare that to say an E-Class or you compare it to a, a 5 Series Touring or you compare it to um, an Audi A6, yeah it's a lot more money but it's a lot more car, you know, and it's extremely, uh, extremely exciting to drive. I'm just asked at the lights next to me here, I've got an Audi S3, I'm just wondering, is it going to want to race? No, we're not going to do racing, we're not racing, not today. And certainly, not something I'd recommend you ever did. So, let's talk a little bit more about GT car product allocation. Because, you know, it does upset people when it comes to Porsche, that they can't get the cars that they want. You know, they love the brand. I had someone message me today, and he was saying, yeah, like to, I would like to GT4, but you know, I was told I couldn't have one. Then I went into my local dealer, and there's two used ones for sale. And there's hardly any miles on the clock. If you want a really, really difficult job, if you want a really, really, really just an impossible job, then become someone that has the decision 
on who allocates the GT cars to which customers because you know it must be very very hard you've got 20 30 40 50 people some of these people would have spent 50 60 70 80 90 thousand pounds and above on your brand in your showroom and they're asking for a GT car along with lots of other people and you know how do they actually decide well obviously they're going to have to look after the customers that have spent reasonable amounts of money with them and that has to be that has to be a consideration because that has to be a consideration because let's put the beans on slightly there it has to be a consideration because at the end of the day if someone's buying the family car you know their work car and they're spending hundreds of thousands of pounds maybe you know millions of pounds over the years and they want to get a GT car then how would you go about not giving them one and how would you sort of let them down on that because it wouldn't be very very easy would it so you're obviously going to be torn between perhaps enthusiasts you can see as an enthusiast someone who's definitely going to use that GT car who spent a small amount of money with you and then there's someone who spent an awful lot of money with your dealership but perhaps the idea of a track day or using a GT car for its stated purpose is you know extremely unlikely so I, I think that's that's one of the, that's one of the dilemmas that, that dealers have when it comes to GT product because ultimately how are they going to look after them you know this car's got the beans when you want it to have the beans I don't think I don't think an S3 is really going to be able to compete with this car, really in a straight line. Probably not. So that's the dilemma that dealers have. How do we supply 10, 12, 15 cars to what we've got on a list of 50, 60 people? And you can whittle some off. They're out of area. They've never bought anything from us, we've never met these people, then you've no chance. But if you've bought a car from them before, you've used that car as intended, you love the brand, you've got to know the people that work at you get to know the people that, that work there and you've built a relationship with them, then I think there are going to be slots available for people in that situation that don't necessarily spend the most amount of money and those are the people that you've got to uh, you've got to try and look after a little bit I think because ultimately it's not just going to be a case of who spent the most money with us it's as simple as that it's going to be about the relationship it's going to be about will the car be used for its stated purpose and the good thing about Porsche GT product now is now that we've seen the overs market so people are buying a GT4 the guy was messaging me today about a GT4 you know, GT4s aren't for sale in the secondary market for 15 and 20 thousand pounds more than the, you know, the retail price, the price that car was purchased for. And another thing you've, got, thing you've got to bear in mind when it comes to Porsche GT cars is that when a dealer's selling one, he's not selling it with a 1,000 pound margin in it because he's got his staff to pay, he's got, he's got the, you know, the company might have, you know, debt because it's expanded its practice or its building or, you know, it's got the pensions to pay, it's got the lights to put on, the utilities to pay. And at the end of the day, they're not going to be able to sell cars with, with nothing in them. So you're going to expect probably, I would imagine, £10,000 margin in a car. So if someone's bought one and then they've done a thousand miles in it, they go back to their centre and they say, oh, well, I oh, don't like it, it's, it's a bit too stiff, the suspension, or oh, it's not my cup of tea. And then they say, well, will you buy it back off me because I don't, I don't think I like it so much as I thought I would. Then the dealer's not going to say, well, I'll tell you what, we'll sell it, sell it for you and we'll put a thousand pound across the car and try, and try and deal on those terms. You can just forget it, they're not going to do it. So if they've bought it for 95,000 pounds and it's for sale in the dealership at 96 or 97, the guy's lost money on that car. There's no doubt about it. He will not have made any money on that car at all. He's lost. And I think when you get losses starting to happen and people being offered their cars from a part exchange purchase or a re or buy back point of view and they're losing 
six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand pounds, maybe fifteen thousand pounds in some cases, and so on, then you don't come back again for that. So I think the people who perhaps circle the duty allocations, hoping to get something, have it for six months, a year, flip it back, get you know twenty grand out of it extra, you know, happy days. I think those days are gone now. So I think you are going to be. Are oh, you going to have more of a chance of getting, in my view, a GT car in the years ahead? And that's where the 992 GT3, for me, could be the car where you will actually have a chance of, uh, of getting an allocation. If you've been a customer of the centre and you've been in and they know you and uh, you've used your car and you've been loyal to their, to their centre, I think you've got more of a chance than perhaps you've had uh, in recent, uh, recent times. There we go. So let's talk a little bit more about... Um, the Sea Dweller 4000 then, let's get on to this watch. So, again it has a... a flat glass. See that? And the thing that distinguishes this watch from... its predecessor is that it's got bigger plots in the, the actual dial so the markers the dots got bigger it's referred to as a maxi dial now the maxi dial first was introduced in the uh, anniversary submariner um, the green they call it the kermit it's got the green bezel and the black dial they introduced a maxi dial there where it had bigger plots than than standard so the plots in this have got what's called chromolite in them so they have a, a glowing um, property which glows for longer than than, than uh, super lumen overdoors and it, it they glow like a lovely kind of bluey green color so uh, it's um so that was something that, that sort of came along with the, the sort of newer generation watches the other thing about the the sea dwell is it has an extension clasp in it so in the watch you open it up at the back and then it's got this thing here which just opens up like that and that gives you the extra uh, diameter or extra size to get it over a wetsuit, things like that. Now, some people take them out of the sea dwellers, I don't, I leave mine in. Um, and the glide lock at the back, that helps you to sort of set it up um, as you like it. And if you, as your wrist swells and gets a bit hot sometimes, it's nice just to just make that a little bit bigger. Um, the other thing about the ceramic bezel generation watches is that Rolex beefed up the bracelets and what they did was in the middle um, if you look at the older watches ones I've reviewed in the past the middle link is, is hollow so the rivet went through or the screw went through but the, 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 the other bit of the link was sort of hollow and that allowed it to have a bit more play in it but what that allowed to happen was for kind of grime and bits and bobs to get inside there and over years that acted as like a bit of sandpaper and it was sort of get into the ends of the rivets and it would make the braces a little bit loose so when they beefed up the bracelet and they put um, a solid middle link in then what that had the had, had the effect to doing is basically make them a lot more solid also the watch became heavier and uh, it was around that time Rolex really started to motor uh, with their with their retail prices the other thing about this watch which is nice is it has a 60 minute um, bezel so the bezel um, is graduated to 60 it's a 60 minute bezel and on a Submariner you normally get it uh, marked every minute to 15 and then there's nothing else it's just then the, the 10s after that um, but with the uh, with the sea dwellers um, the ceramic one and the deep sea and the current sea dweller 43 millimeter they have a graduated bezel with minutes all the way along it so uh, that's a bit unique and the case is just that little bit thicker they've got the helium escape valve I have a present on sea dwellers and then the back on the side you've got the, the case there so it sits a bit heavier and then because under the case the case back this bit under here that um, has some writing on it which um, so it's one of only two watches Rolex make with writing on the back and that's in a lovely black um, it's kind of engraved and the blacks in there so you've got uh, original escape valve and then you've got Oy Rolex Oyster Sea Dweller and then the Rolex um, symbol. So on the wrist it sits a little bit higher 
um, than a Submariner. And the reason I like these is they're just not very common. I mean, you don't, I've, I've, I think, I've, I know people who own them, but you know, you rarely see people wearing them. Um, I've never seen somebody else wearing one of these ever. Um, you know, in the wild, as they say, I've never seen anyone wearing one. So they are, they are a little bit more, um, a bit more, uh, more rare, which I think uh, makes it a little bit nicer. And of course, it's been a great investment. And having had it only made for so, so few years, um, does make the watch, um, you know, I think more sought after, and will be, will make it much more sought after. Um, there is a watch, there is a watch dealer in the in the US, uh, David S W. Um, I'll put a link in this video to his uh, to a video that he did on his personal collection and he has one of these watches in there and I think for very good reason. Another thing I love about this watch is the crystal on the top it just sticks up slightly so you get a lovely white sort of ring um, as the light catches the crystal, um, sapphire crystal um, very robust you know they, they don't scratch they would chip if they were um, you know it was something sharp but uh, that sort of lovely white look on the top of the crystal super um, the other thing about this watch um, keep taking it on and off my wrist but is that the dial is different to a submariner dial this ceramic submariner dial it's not gloss it's got more of a matte to it so what happens is is that in the right light it, it, it looks very very black and then other times it can look a bit grey um, and the sea dweller it has a flat S in the dime, you can see that. Get that to the seed. Well, it's a flat S. Another little known fact is that that um, matches the S in the sea dweller on my deep sea, like a squashed S, which is uh, something again. I think it's quite it's nice to have a, a two watches that kind of got those matching sea dweller S's. So, yeah, I love this watch. Um, of wearing it, it's probably one of my most worn steel watches. Um, does everything, looks great, nice and chunky on the wrist. Super watch, super watch to have. I love having it in my collection. So, in part two, we'll talk more about maybe my idea for for Drive and Venture Car Club 2021. Cars coming up on the channel, so stay tuned for part two. So, what's got me to thinking about a car club? Well. I'm in a couple of car clubs. Um, the one that I enjoy the most is Supercar Driver. Um, that has a, a criteria for people to join it. So, you know, if you've got a box standard Porsche car, like a GTS 911, you can't be a member. And that's not to not decry them. I think they do a fantastic job. I think the photography, the social media outputs, how they capture the trips and the tours that they do. I'm sure you've all seen them. It's just fantastic. Uh, I've really enjoyed the uh, GT tour in Wales for the last few years. Fantastic. And also, um, I was very much looking forward to going to Europe in 2020 this year for the GT tour in the Alps and I'm in Germany and the Stuttgart the Porsche factory and all that, in Switzerland and Austria and that. And I'm seriously thinking about the Dolomite strip um, after that trip in June 2021 because I have to put it back a year. But these trips are in, you're in to five or seven thousand pounds plus your fuel, plus your drinks, plus your extras, you know. So it's not for, you know, it's not for the middle of the road person, I think. So whilst I continue, I think, to stick with these guys and, you know, enjoy myself on some of their trips, I think. I think the motion community, the motion people, people got sports car community, people got cars, they actually are yearning for something or looking for something that's a bit more um, middle of the road, uh, more affordable, maybe does more drives, more meetups and things like that, and social stuff. So that's got me to thinking that, you know, could drive venture move into that space and, you know, have a northern feel to it. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be driving down south and all that, which is a shame, but as it grows, maybe that could happen. Um, another car club I'm in is, the, as you can imagine, the Porsche Club GB. I've been that since 2016, and you know, I think it's got some very good people in it. Um, 
it does put some good sort of classic static stuff on like your Silverstone Classic, Kip Silverstone and things like that, and Gold Cup and that. But I think it's just, I don't know, it's not, it's heart's not beating as well as it could, put it that way. I think, I think that um, there's a lot of members in it and obviously being officially Porsche approved, obviously that naturally uh, attracts people to it. So for what it costs a year, I think I pay about £70 a year, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not even a meal out, you know, it's not really a consideration for cost. Um, the trips don't cost on top. Uh, obviously, if they put a trip on abroad or they put a trip on in England, it's just the cost of the trip. There's not a profit motive, which I think is very, very welcome. And I think people uh, like that. So uh, it's probably something I'll, I'll, I'll stick with um, for, for the future. But I would like to see them do a bit more around my appetites and tastes. And I know there are other people in the club who feel the same way, whether that happens. We'll just have to do have to wait and see. So I think my club, my my idea is to get something that's sort of cents for money on an annual membership fee, trips sort of at cost. The only thing we'd be looking for on top of that perhaps will be things like covering the media so we can have a film, a photography. It's nothing worse than going on a great trip, going to a great location and then you know, a few months later you're thinking oh it was a great trip and you've got a few shots on your phone and that it's not at the same level um, and that's the thing I've noticed in, you know, getting into Instagram more is that if you've got a professional behind the lens and he's taking them shots and the guy who's not doing on videos and that's going to mean that you actually have the memories to look back on and I'll always look back on that birthday weekend trip to Scotland with one of my pals and think wow you know what an amazing trip and I think everyone would say the same that came on the trip you know they would say well yeah that was incredible so that's my there are plans for 2021 let's see if I can pull it off um, you know I think there is a demand I think there's appetite for it I think we would we would be successful I'm not looking to make pots and pots of money out of it you know that's not the motive to make enough money doing other things in financial services um, so there we go I was almost saying to myself, should I go in after getting the fuel at Costco? I've got my fuel, should I go in and get anything? I don't think we need anything. And 240 quid later. <laughs> anyway. anyway, so there we are. A bit of rambling today around different things. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what's coming up. I have just driven uh, the fabulous Yaris Gazoo Racing. I've just done a review on that car and that video's coming out. <laughs> it's a very exciting car, I'm not going to give too much away. Um, so that, that car has been driven now and I really enjoy driving it for the money. I think it's quite quite sensational value. All that WRC tech, but more on that car very soon. And I've also got a GT4, the 718 GT4. I did try and record that just very recently, but the weather was against us, so we had to abandon it. So that, that's been pushed back a little bit, but that car is very much on the horizon. Um, Toyota would like me to do the Supra, so I think we will do that as well, the Supra, you know, a very competitively priced car for the performance and the dynamics of that car. So we're hoping that uh, we can get access to that car and do that car as well. And there may be some other Toyota stuff because it seems to, seem to want me to do some stuff. So we're also, we're also in discussions, we're trying to get in with a BMW and a Land Rover um, dealer in the north so we're hoping something will come of that so I can put some BMW products on the channel because I do, do like BMW um, I think it's lost its way a little bit since I came out of my V8 M3 but you know it's got some great stuff M2 CS you, you know Evo car of the year so you know let's hope that can come off and we can start putting some uh, full lights on now it's going to be misty and foggy so let's hope we can get that on the channel for you guys to enjoy some BMW stuff. And of course, Land Rover, Range Rover, you know, goes well with the kind of backdrops that we were filming in. So let's hope we can, we can put that on. So uh, hope you enjoyed today's video. Please get in touch with me, david at driveinventure.com about the car club or any sort of car questions, stuff you'd like me to cover off. And uh, as always, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, click that notification button put some comments in if you like and as always I'll see you next time